Welcome back again, everybody. Uh, we are going to continue on our adventure down tissues. Today, we're going to be looking specifically at connective tissues. So, let's uh, just as a reminder, uh, you've got to know the tissue name, the location, and the function for all of these tissues. Okay, that we're going over. Um, and you can expect to see some images on tests and be able to identify what they are. Uh, since all of our exams and quizzes are online, you'll have nice colored photos of the histology, so you should be able to figure out what it is exactly you're looking at and be able to apply that to uh, either body region, structure, or some kind of function. All right, so our learning outcomes here today, really kind of straightforward was the structure, the function, and the location of connective tissues. Now, before we get going, if you remember, we, uh, we were talking about four different types of tissues. Epithelial tissue, which we talked about last lecture. Today, connective tissue, and then our next lecture will be nervous and muscle. Connective tissue, the largest uh, of the four groups right now. So there'll be a lot going on today, but let's start with a little bit of practice here. What do you think we have in this image. So if you need to pause it and kind of think about this and look around, remember to use those observation skills. All right, so here we have dense connective tissue of which we're looking specifically at dense irregular connective tissue. Uh, one of the things you're going to notice is that these fibers are moving in all kinds of different directions. How about this one? All right, hopefully you said dense connective tissue again, but this time it's dense regular connective tissue. So the fibers in here are nice and parallel and wavy and kind of orderly in this image versus our last one. And then last, what about this one? This one's always an oddball. Okay, maybe you said this is loose connective tissue, in which case it would be reticular. So in the loose connective tissue, we can see there's a lot of these cells in here. We have some fibers um, and space in between all of those. So we're gonna get into all the characteristics of these today. Here's one more for you. Hopefully this one stands out. All right, what you probably noticed are these dark, lines in here. So these are those elastic fibers and a lot of them are wavy uh, and that's a good indicator of elastic connective tissue because those are stretch and recoil, stretch and recoil. So uh, that is a dense connective tissue as well. So lots of fibers going on in there. And how about this one? Big empty spaces. We see that plasma membrane right here, and we can see those nuclei pushed out towards the sides of those big empty spaces. So this is our adipose tissue. This is a loose connective tissue, and that's going to give us room to store lipids. And if you remember from our first lecture uh, with tissues, we talked about um, the hypertrophy of cells getting larger, and, um, and so adipose tissue is one of our examples. So as we store more fats in there, we need to get them bigger and bigger. Here's that chart again. Remember, make sure you practice this a lot. Use this as, as a good study tool. So here's our nervous tissue, muscle, epithelial, and connective tissue. And today we're going to be working our way through all of these different tissues. Uh, so lots to look at today. So hang tight, get yourself a bottle of water and a little snack. We'll be here for probably three or four hours. I'm just kidding, it's not that long. It'll be about an hour lecture again, um, except for you know, pausing and, and working on some of these practice problems. Now, let's look at a couple things as we move through here. So things that we're gonna identify um, and, and get to know and become familiar with. Cell types. Uh, that we might see in these uh, tissues are macrophages. So they're going to 
you gobble up things that uh, shouldn't be there, debris, pathogens, and then we use that process of phagocytosis that we talked about earlier. We have fibroblasts, which are going to give rise to these collagen fibers. We'll see some lymphocytes. Uh, these are immune cells. Again, we're going to learn a lot more about that in 2 and 2. Um, over in this image, we can see some fat cells. We'll talk about that. Mast cells, we probably won't touch on very much. Neutrophils, that's another type of immune cell. Uh, in our extracellular matrix, we have ground substance fibers. So these are things like collagen, elastic, and reticular fibers. And they all have different functions based off of their prevalence and the type of tissue that they're in. Uh, and so we're going to learn about where these come into play. And then we see capillaries passing through here. And that's one of the benefits of connective tissue is that we actually have space for capillaries and nerves to migrate through and move around. Now, really quick, before we get going, spend a little bit of time thinking about epithelial tissue and what it is you know about connective tissue from your labs. So form, function, what kind of cells are around, what about the matrix that you just mentioned, uh, vasculature, innervation. Think about those things, compare and contrast those. And then remember how we name epithelial tissues? It's going to be important to, to kind of compare and contrast that with connective tissue. And then can you challenge yourself and remember everything from last week? So go ahead and pause the video, spend a few moments trying to go through all this. Write it down, check your notes, uh, and then we'll move on whenever you, whenever you press play. All right, welcome back. Uh, hope you did all right. Hope you were able to get it all out of your brain, get it on some paper. Keep doing this all week long. Practice, practice, practice. So let's jump into our connective tissue, and we'll start here with our connective tissue proper. So you can see in this diagram, uh, on the left, we have our tissue class, and on the right, we have our subclasses, okay? So we're gonna work through this part first, our connective tissue proper. Remember, there's four types of connective tissue. So connective tissue proper, cartilage, bone tissue, and blood, right? And so, uh, we're going to look at connective tissue proper first, of which there's two subclasses, loose and dense connective tissue. Now, how do we know the difference? Very similar to what we did with epithelial tissue. We started with the number of layers, and then we talked about cell shape. Well, here, what we're going to be looking at is the ratio of our cells to our fibers. Okay, so when you're looking at loose connective tissue, what you're looking for are more cells than there are fibers. And in dense connective tissue, we're looking to see that there's more fibers than there are cells. So this is, again, why observation is really important and really spending time looking at these images and these slides so that you can really get to know what is around there. So when we look at this tissue, uh, we can see that we've got three types of uh, fibers in here. We've got our elastic fibers, nice and wavy. We've got big pink collagen fibers there, and we've got some reticular fibers down there. So it's very loose arrangement of these fibers. And we have some scattered cell types uh, that are kind of spread out throughout our image here, okay? So this is our areolar tissue. This is really important because it lies below our epithelial tissue and it allows for blood vessels and nerves to move through here. If you remember uh, from labs, epithelial tissue, the cells are tightly adhered and there's almost no extracellular matrix. So there's no real room for blood vessels and nerves to, to penetrate in there. Whereas with this hip, uh, tissue, this areolar tissue, you can see there's lots of room for blood vessels to migrate through there. We see this attaching uh, epithelial tissue to connective tissue uh, layers below that. Um, and we also find it surrounding some of our organs. 
Next, uh, we have adipose connective tissue. So again, we see this nucleus of our adipose cell, and we have this really big vacuum here where we're going to store uh, lipids. So large, empty-looking cells. The nucleus is generally pushed up against the side. Uh, they function for energy storage, also insulation and cushioning. So we'll see these around your kidneys and sitting around your heart. Helps protect our internal organs. So the fat below our skin in what's called the hypodermis, which we'll learn about here in a couple of lectures, the breasts and around our part of the organs. All right, and so here's that reticular connective tissue image that you saw uh, earlier. Now, it's a loose network of fibers and cells, and it creates a, a supportive framework for our organs. Uh, if you think about orange bags, uh, you go to the store and you buy these little QB oranges, and they come in that little fiber mesh orange bag. Um, it kind of offers the same sort of uh, support for our organs. Uh, you can find this in our lymph nodes, our spleen, and in the thymus. Now, if we look at uh, dense connective tissue proper, we'll see some examples here. So, uh, again, remember, back up here, um, a dense connective tissue proper is going to have more fibers than uh, the cells. And so, if we look in here, we can see that we have some fibroblasts uh, in these dark, you know, uh, dark staining little dots here. And then we have all of these uh, parallel fibers, these collagen fibers, okay? Now, when you look at this, they're very dense, they're parallel, they're kind of wavy in shape, not like the elastic tissue fibers that are, or sorry, the elastic fibers that are really almost zigzaggy. But um, these are found in our, our tendons and our ligaments, and they're found in areas where we want uh, strength along one plane of direction. So if you look at this image, and we were to put uh, some kind of clamp over on the left side, a clamp over on the right side, and we were to pull this tissue in this direction, it would be really, really, really strong. But if we were to put that clamp on the top and the bottom and pull it apart, it would pull those collagen fibers apart and it wouldn't be as strong. So, uh, we, like I said, we find this in ligaments and tendons, and it's there to resist forces in one direction. And when you think about that, um, when we have, if you've ever had an ACL tear, an MCL, or LCL injury, um, generally those ligaments are there to hold or are resisting tension in one direction. And if you get a uh, get tackled, if you're playing football or, or, or soccer, and you get hit in the side of your knee, you're creating this force uh, from a lateral or maybe medial direction, and that's not the direction that those uh, ligaments are supposed to be at their strong point or resisting. If we look at dense irregular connective tissue, though, uh, this is, uh, we have these uh, uh, fibroblast nuclei here, um, we have our collagen fibers here, but it's kind of chaotic and swirly, and it's because these collagen fibers are kind of in all different directions, okay? So uh, they're very random, and they uh, uh, withstand stress in all directions. So we could put our clamps on this tissue and pull in every direction, and that's going to withstand that stressors. Now we find this in our dermis, so the layer right below our epidermis, so our skin, our integumentary system is made of the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, and so that dermis is really strong and that's going to kind of resist the pulling and, and, and uh, yanking on your skin. Uh, you find it in sheets on our cartilage and bone as well, um, and it, it allows for um, those muscle tendons to kind of integrate. Let's move on. So uh, our next dense connective tissue that we're going to look at is elastic connective tissue. Again, you can see these really great example of uh, elastic fibers in there, really wavy, dark staining, um, and, and so those are going to be able to stretch and recoil, which is the function of our, our tissue here. We find this in arterial walls. Um, those walls need to resist uh, your blood pressure. 
And so it'll actually expand and then uh, recoil, expand and then recoil. All right, next tissue is our cartilage. So here we are on this diagram. We're going to look at three types of cartilage. Uh, you're going to be looking at these in the articulations lab. Uh, there are slides in labs, so you'll be able to pick those up whenever um, the articulations lab is open for a month, and that's all online uh, for you to, to work with. Um, now, there is no blood flow. There are no blood vessels going into this cartilage, so it takes a long time for a cartilage to heal. Uh, it has to rely on diffusion from the underlying layers to bring in nutrients, get rid of wastes, and kind of clean things up. All right, the first one we're going to look at is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage, as you can see over here to the right, is kind of clear, kind of has a glassy matrix to it. Um, within there, you can't see it in this image, but uh, the it has collagen fibers that are kind of dispersed throughout that matrix. Um, and you'll notice that you have these clear little areas. These are called lacunae. Uh, and inside of those, they have little tiny dots. And those are the chondrocytes. Chondro is cartilage, site means cell. So these are cartilage cells. Uh, and they reside in those lacunae. They're sort of trapped in there forever. Now, where do we find this stuff? Well, when you are, as you can see in this image in the bottom right, and I would say my head is probably there, so I might be able to turn the bottom. Uh, they make up our, our, um, our skeleton when we're really, really young, as we're developing um, inside the womb. And uh, as we develop and get older, we see that hyaline cartilage in, um, around the ends of our bones at the sternal ends of our ribs. So between our ribs and our sternum, we have a hyaline cartilage that's a little bit flexible um, and, and, and allows some cushioning. And we find it in our larynx and our trachea and our bronchi to keep those airways open. Um, and it just helps with reducing friction at the end at our joints um, and keeps our airways open. Fibrocartilage then uh, is very fibrous, if you couldn't tell by the name. It has a lot of parallel collagen fibers in it, so we can see these collagen fibers in here, over to the left. Um, it doesn't have a perichondrium. Uh, if you remember, we talked about a periosteum, and I'll just go back to this. Hyaline cartilage does have that perichondrium. It's a, connective tissue layer on the outside of it that kind of surrounds that cartilage. Um, so here, when we look at this tissue, we can see there is a lot of fibers in there, and that's going to give this tissue a lot more strength. So it's not it's going to be uh, less flexible and uh, offer less movement. So we have these, uh, this tissue in areas we need a lot of strength, so your pubic synthesis, um, the meniscus, your intervertebral discs, right? We want a lot of strength there. Um, we don't want those discs rupturing. Take it from somebody that has three disc bulges, uh, as you know, fine. So what does this stuff do? It's resisting compression, and, and it helps to absorb shock. So when you're jumping up and down, uh, the meniscus in your knee is there to cushion those bones, Hitting together, uh, it's there to uh, kind of reduce wear and tear over time. And then our last cartilage is elastic cartilage. So you can uh, grab your ears there and thank your elastic cartilage uh, for keeping those nice and flexible. Um, elastic cartilage, we have elastic fibers within there. So in this image over here, you can see these elastic fibers highlighted in there. Um, that's going to allow this cartilage to have some flexibility. It has a perichondrium on the outside there. Uh, and again, you can see those chondrocytes sitting within the lacuna. Uh, it kind of looks very similar to the spongy bone slide, and that's a, mostly due to the purple staining. So when you're working in a lab, try to not get those confused with each other. 
So your epiglottis, the little flap of cartilage in your, um, in your larynx there, so when you swallow food, that thing goes and covers up your airway and deflects your food into your esophagus um, rather than you know, having, having it depend on the airway, which is never any fun. So here's our review and reinforce slide. Take a few moments, look over these questions, digest a little bit of what we've talked about right now, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Oh, welcome back again. So how did that go? Hopefully you're feeling a little bit uh, better about this. Maybe you're uh, making flashcards uh, as we go through with these re review and reinforce questions. Maybe you're making note of these somewhere Type it out on um, some software and making yourself flashcards. So, anyways, just some ideas if you're not. Next tissue we have is bone tissue. So we have two subclasses of bone tissue, compact and spongy bone. So let's look at those. Uh, at this point, I think you have been in lab and have already seen our bone tissue. But if you remember, we have our osteons, right? And, um, and we have these little tree rings around the central canal. And so we call those lamellae. And we see those lacunae inside uh, of those lamellae as well, right? And inside of those lacunae would be osteocytes, so bone cells. Uh, we will... Uh, in a couple of lectures when we get into the skeletal system, we'll come back and look at the differences between compact and spongy bone. So for now, just that's kind of our introduction to bone. Then last is our blood tissue. Okay, so here is a nice image of blood tissue. We've got a handful of things going on in here. We've got these nice red circles or these discs, remember discoid shaped cells, um, and these are our red blood cells. So these are going to be responsible for transporting uh, mostly oxygen. They do carry a little bit of carbon dioxide on the body, but mostly they are picking up oxygen. Remember we said they lose their nucleus, which is why we don't see a nucleus in here, because we want to fill those up with hemoglobin so that we can bind oxygen and take it to where it needs to go. We also have little thrombocytes. These are platelets. We've talked about platelets with blood clotting and um, uh, positive feedback systems. So these are these little tiny dots here. And then you can see these really large cells over here with really big dark staining nucleus. These are uh, a couple of white blood cells. Um, there's a bunch that you'll learn about later in 202, but for right now, you know, just kind of know that they exist and they play a bunch of different roles when we have um, different types of infections or inflammation, uh, things like that, uh, that these cells are going to be involved in. All right, so that is it for uh, connective tissues. Now we're just going to go touch on our last two types of tissues. So we have muscle and nervous tissue to come back to and go over. So we are going to start here with our nervous tissue. This is responsible for internal communication, right? So information coming in, if you remember our aphenorne and aphenorne pathways, so information is going to come in, be transmitted through nerves back to our brain or to some control center. Information is then sent back out through those aphenorne pathways to effectors. And this is all reliant nervous tissue, the neurons. So here's a really nice image. You probably have seen this in the labs. Uh, and this is, as we can see here, uh, the soma or the cell body of a nerve. Uh, we've got our axon that's leading over this way. And coming off of that body, uh, we've got various dendrites, or little uh, branches that are going to bring information in. We can also see all these little tiny dots. These are glial cells, and we'll get into that in Unit 3, but basically uh, lots of different types of, of glial cells that help to support the nervous system. So they're large star-shaped cells, 
uh, with you know, glial cells nearby, so again, these are our nervous tissue, uh, and so it is responsible for transmitting information and again, helping us with learning. Find it in our brain and our spinal cord. And then the last group is our muscle tissue. And muscle tissue is responsible for contractility. It's going to shorten, it's going to move us, help us move things inside of our body. It's going to move our heart. It's going to help us uh, move around in the external environment. So our three types uh, are skeletal muscle, cardiac, and smooth muscle. So the first one here, if we take a look at that, we can see we've got some nuclei. And in past lectures, we've talked about the importance of having multiple nuclei for this skeletal muscle. Uh, we also see these really long cylindrical uh, muscle fibers, these unbranched cells. So this is one muscle cell right here, right? And um, they have these striations along them. We'll learn what those striations are and how they form and what they do for these cells. So uh, we find it in all of our skeletal muscles, right? Our biceps, our quadriceps, our calf muscles, um, all of our voluntary uh, muscles that we contract. So that's a big distinguishing characteristic for skeletal muscle. Now, two other things. Uh, you got to know that skeletal muscle is voluntary. We control. We make sure uh, that we can move it. And we also need to know that striations are not stratifications. They sound very similar. It's kind of like uh, metastasis and metaplasia. Okay? They're similar terms, but you have to figure out how to help yourself memorize these. So striations are these lines that run perpendicular to the cell, uh, where stratification means layer. Uh, and what you'll see when we get into the uh, muscular system is that we can call these fibers uh, cells, or we can call these cells fibers, okay? Um, same sort of thing, we call muscle fibers, because uh, their cells are these long cylindrical shape. Now, if we look at these images, a little bit different. Uh, what do you notice? Well, if you look at this uh, cell right here, see a nice big nucleus, and we see the plasma membrane out here. But we can notice that these cells are branched. And we also see, so that's one difference, but we also see our striations that are running perpendicular to our, our cell shapes. So these cells are short and branched, which gives them strength. Um, and it allows them co to communicate with multiple other cells at once. So when electrical signals are being passed down uh, these cells, one cell can communicate with three or four different cells. They're held together by intercalated disks. You'll learn all about those in 202. But for right now, they just kind of help with communication and holding their cells together. And they generally only have one nuclear cell, whereas our skeletal muscle was multi -nuclear. So we find this in our heart, okay? It's constantly beating and it's involuntary. We can control it on sort of a secondary uh, manner by breathing harder or running or exercising or laying down and meditating. Um, but you know, looking at your heart and saying, mm, speed up, uh, it just doesn't work as well as like, hey, pick this thing up and I'm gonna move my arms. Uh, in the heart, we call the cells and stuff fibers. We generally refer to them as myocytes. Um, so. And last, this brings us to um, our smooth muscles. So these muscle cells are really short and sort of football shaped. They're non striated, so you won't see any striations in these cells here, uh, like we saw with the other two types. We generally only have one central nucleus here, and uh, this tissue is involuntary as well, like your cardiac muscles. So we find this in our digestive tract, our blood vessels, the uterus. Remember we talked about positive feedback loops in birth, so oxytocin is released. that stimulates these muscle cells here, these muscle fibers, uh, to contract. 
and that forces our baby out, uh, then initiating positive feedback and releasing more oxytocin. Uh, we find it in our digestive system uh, and in uh, our pupils. So it's really good at sustained contractions, birth, or helping to move that food along. So that brings us to the end of our tissue lecture. Uh, good luck studying all this and digesting this all. Use your smooth muscle. Um, practice identifying the tissue, location, and function. Our next lecture, we're going to be diving into the integumentary system and learning about what this biggest organ of our body does for us. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I'll catch you next time.